because you've spent all this time and, and a lot of money, um, dealing with this disease, getting rid of it. Now you call yourself ne- negative or, and, and so how do you prevent it from getting back in? It's, it's absolutely, you, you said it, right. It's increasing biosecurity. It's increasing awareness as well. I feel, um, efficiency and biosecurity are just polar opposites. It, it feels the more efficient you are, the more your biosecurity will suffer. Welcome, everybody, to the Swinet Canada podcast. My name is Dan Columbus, and I will be your host for today's episode. And with me today, I have Dr. Melissa DeRoche, who is a production veterinarian with High Life. So welcome to the show, Melissa. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, how are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? Uh, I'm doing fantastic. So before we, we get to the today's topic, which I'm sure people are going to guess is swine health <laughs> uh, to some to some degree, uh, just because they, our listeners might not be familiar with who you are and what you do, I just ask you to kind of introduce yourself and let us know about you know your journey so far and what's what's brought you to to where you are today. Sure. Um, so as you said, my name is Melissa DeRoche, and I'm currently working at High Life as a production veterinarian with pigs. I am originally from Manitoba in Winnipeg, born right in the city in South Saint Patel. For anyone who knows the area, um, so how I ended up in pigs is a bit of a a bit of a story. Um, it's the a few girls I know actually have the same story of I went on a farm, thought, wow, these are really cute. I think I could do this. And and that's how we ended up interested in, in pigs. I went to WCVM in Saskatoon for my under or for my vet degree. And then after I graduated in 2015, I actually did two and a half years in mixed animal practice in New Zealand before I ended up coming back to to Canada where I where I got this job with High Life. And I actually came back for this job. So, so I'm very lucky and very happy to be where I am now. Swine Veterinary Partners offers a full range of animal health and production services to Canadian pork producers. We approach health management through personalized solution with concern for profitability while taking into account performance and the well-being of your animals. Yeah, when I saw that you you know you've been kind of all over and and you end up with pigs, I mean the question kind of came to mind like how how did that happen? Because that's not generally the career path that a lot of people are going for when they when they start vet school or, or something. Yeah, I my original exposure was at U of M where I did my undergrad, and then um, going through through vet school, I wanted to be a swine vet, but I also wanted to do something fun. And so I, I kind of took the job that I got in anywhere where I could find it. And that happened to be in New Zealand, which my husband was very excited about because he was an easy tag along. So yeah, can't really complain about it, an opportunity to go down and work in New Zealand for a while. And... <laughs> no, exactly. It, they, yeah. it really is a mini Canada. It's, it's expensive to get there, but it's it's worth it. <laughs> well, hopefully one day I get the chance to go. Um, so today's topic obviously is going to be vet related, and specifically with swine health. Uh, and I know you've specifically talked about wanting to uh, mention the the work that's been going on with mycoplasma high pneumonia eradication. I hope I pronounced that right because I am not a vet. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we'll just get started with why that particular pathogen and, and, and you know, why it's important, you know, and, 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 maybe why that was the focus. Yeah, for sure. So I kind of fell into this project. I didn't have much, I shouldn't say I didn't have an interest beforehand, but it was just another one of those bugs that a lot of farms have considered one of the the main things. You either have it or you don't. And a lot of farms, particularly in this area, they do. So mycoplasma, high pneumonia, you know, lots of vaccination programs, a lot of information on it. Not usually the most difficult to control, but there was a lot of discussion, particularly south of the border, about eradicating, and they were successfully eradicating this pathogen from farms, um, leading just to healthier stock, leading to increased average daily gain, you know, increased profits, which is, at the end of the day, what a lot of us are, are here to support in production. So, with High Life, it ended up being that we have a flow. It's very well located. It's three cell farms with their commingled nursery, and then they have all of their 
their associated finishing barns. We were under the impression that the sow farms were negative for mycoplasma, and then they would mix into their nursery and finisher, which were positive. And then all of a sudden, we had a positive in the sow barn. Sorry, I should backtrack a little bit. We were under the impression that they were all negative and that the finishers were positive. We've tried to eradicate a few times before I had started with the company unsuccessfully, but the flow is doing well, so no big deal kind of thing. And then it so happened that one of our cell farms broke, but the other two did not, which after further investigation led us to maybe we didn't successfully eradicate because our cell farms are actually positive. So flowing positive pigs into our positive nursery to positive finisher, you're not going to get it out of the finisher unless you get it out of the cell farm. So so that's sort of where we where we started here is, hey, this is a really, really well located flow. They're by themselves, they're their own loop. So why don't we just see if we can get rid of it? And that's so we did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you, you mentioned at first that you had tried uh, maybe to eradicate this, maybe not successful. So I guess the, the question is, you know, what could possibly have been preventing that from happening? And maybe that leads into then what what, what steps you, you took to then achieve that successful eradication? Yeah, so we ended up modeling a little bit of our sort of status, just determining the status of the farms off of there's an AASV per status chart that, that we used. They, I believe there is one for mycoplasma now, but at the time there wasn't one. So we used that one to just dis- define, are we positive? Are we stable? Are we unstable? Um, obviously, we thought the pigs coming in were negative, but they weren't. So it didn't really matter what we would do in the finishing because they're coming in positive, right? Um, but what we were trying to do is it was it was thought to be something that's really easy to get rid of. You can just walk it out of the barn, right? You empty all the pigs all in, all out, clean it up, put in negative pigs and, and you know, have your pie or whatever you're saying here is. Um, <laughs> but they just, they just kept breaking at the very typical time. They were very clinically affected, lots of coughing, lots of, lots of sick pigs. And so, Further and further diagnostics and further exploration found, led us to finding the positives on farm. And then when that sow farm actually ended up breaking, and it, it was quite significantly affected as well. But when one sow farm breaks and another one doesn't, you know, you start to kind of wonder, okay, well, what's going on here, right? So then I then I guess once once you've identified that there's a problem, then what, what kind of steps did you start to look at for... Yeah. So the first thing that we wanted to do is that we wanted to stabilize the herd. We wanted to stabilize the flow um, and then just get right started onto our eradication because... So it, it ended up having a little bit of a a steep learning curve, particularly in the beginning, because part of the eradication is successful exposure, is su- successfully making sure that everybody has has a day zero and that you know what day zero is. Because if you think day zero is today, but it's not until four weeks later, you're going to have a really rough last last month. So once you expose your pig, there's literature that says that your, micro, your pig can shed mycoplasma for up to 280 days. That is obviously a long time. Um, so if you're four weeks out, you are going to open your herd at the 280 days, but maybe you're still shedding for another month and you've just unfortunately kiboshed your entire eradication protocol. So everything ends up in about an eight month. It's an eight month process at a minimum. A lot of actual consultation with some vets down in the States who had done it, particularly in Minnesota. Um, so we worked with them just to to create a a protocol. And now we have a template that we use that we can apply to all of our farms. So it started with with this flow and we've now eradicated um, PERS and MICO from a second flow and we're doing a third, fourth and fifth flow currently using the same protocol. So it was developing a protocol that was something easy for, number one, easy for the farms to, um, not not to understand, but just to present the information in a way that it wasn't overwhelming because being an eight month process, there's a lot of different things you have to consider. So you don't give them the whole 50 page booklet and say, okay, guys, this is how we're going to do it. Good luck. I'll uh, see you in eight months to do some more testing. And every farm actually ended up getting a different version of the same protocols so that people could really get on board and really, really commit. Um our protocol starts off, it starts off with the gilts. It always has to start with the gilts. How are you going to manage the gilts coming in? 
if you don't have anywhere to put them, that's fine. Just be aware that you're going to have opportunity piglets. Just there's an opportunity cost in the loss of piglet production. You can't you can call your sows, but you're not bringing any sows in. So the idea is you you load up the herd with as many gilts as you can if you have an offsite cue barn or an offsite finisher where you can upload your gilts and maintain their health status, expose them, have your day zero, breed them as you need to. It's a luxury some people have and some people don't. We were very lucky in this particular case to have three separate cue barns that we could maintain on that site. So we loaded them up, we exposed them to mycoplasma with a with a lung homogenate that we that we made ourselves. So our, our protocol's there. So once you expose everybody and you have, you know, you're presumed positive, you're going to want to check and make sure that you're actually positive in your guilt so that you can confirm your, your day zero. Big question, how many guilts do you sample? How, how many guilts can you put in your cue barn? How long is your herd going to be closed? Because we actually had one big hiccup and, and big learning, learning issue for us was that we didn't put too many guilts in the cue barn, but we had to delay our opening. And so our guilts got too old and they got too big and we actually struggled just to bring them in and, and breed them properly because they were too old. Um, so that was a bit of a learning learning curve for us. Once your herd is closed, there's a lot a lot of hurry up and wait. Um, you have to wait for your herd to stop shedding. You have to. We recommend that you do a full cleanup. Um, Mycoplasma is not a very not a very hardy bug, um, but if you're going to go through the effort. Let's do this once and let's do it right. So I often will suggest I have a little a list of rooms. So it's very similar to if anyone is familiar with the Manitoba swine industry, we're all about PD and knock on wood, not not this year and hopefully not for many years again, but it's a very similar cleanup protocol. So everywhere you can think of, everything gets emptied, everything gets washed and and often we will lime it as well. Just let's clean up this farm. Um, once we get closer to the end of our closure period, we will medicate the sows with feed medication. I prefer to use two different types of medication because culture and sensitivity is virtually impossible in before mycoplasma. It's I'm told it's very difficult to grow. So I just hit it from two different angles. I'll do feed medication. I'll often use a, a lincomycin in the feed, and then I'll do a chlortetracycline as well, just, just in case we have any any um susceptibility issues for that's for the sows just so that we can stop any last minute shedding if our day zero is wrong we'll also use a tulathromycin on our piglets for four weeks so the first week we're going to use tulathromycin for everybody on the ground so i say if there's four feet on the ground they get a medication um and then i'm going to give everyone at processing the medication for week two week three and four is day is piglets 14 days and up. And that way, we're covering the entire herd is getting medicated and we're really just hammering down any residual mycoplasma that the pigs might be shedding. During that, we're also going to be sampling. I highly recommend that we sample all of our dead sows and our, we don't have any gills. So all of our dead sows and we will also sample our piglets. We've always done combination PERS and mycoplasma eradications. For, for mycoplasma, I do tracheal swabs and we just do the PCR on that. So a before sample and an, and after samples, they should all be negative at this point. But if you have positives, then you can consider, do I delay the herd? Do I think it's a real positive? If you're vaccinating your herd, there, your vaccine can cause, can cause positives. Um, one big draw or one big, I guess, one issue that you can have is it a PCR. It's, it's, you know, it's finding the the pathogen, but is it alive or is it dead? So that's something that I know is being worked on in a research setting. Um, and when we asked, was not commercially available yet. So keeping an eye on that, but I think that will be really, really handy in future eradications, particularly because everybody is using vaccine. Everybody is getting it on their gloves or, you know, getting it everywhere, right? Because when you're doing either a mass vaccination or you're vaccinating at weaning, there's vaccine there, and then you go and sample your pigs. Well, of course, you're going to have a positive here and there. So that's going to be very, very useful. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's just one step after one step after another. Um, 
once you're happy and you have your negatives, usually I have a predetermined, I need, um, we'll start sampling six weeks before we bring the guilts in. And as long as I have my negatives, I'm happy to bring, to bring my guilts in. And then I sample my guilts. Here's the, the big question is depending on the vet, they're going to probably tell you what you want. What is going to constitute a negative? When do you sample those guilts? Um, I like to sample them a month after entry, and then I sample them again six months after entry. And I'll sample, if anyone starts coughing in the in-between, then I'll sample them as well for mycoplasma. And I also, well, they're already tagged, but we make sure to sample the same, the same guilts when they go in. <sighs> and so far, so far, everything has always been, always been good. I'm sure there will be a day where it's not, but, uh, yeah, I'm, well, <laughs> hopefully there isn't, but, but you always right. have to prepare, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's a, it, it was long, but it was kind of a brief summary of, of what kind of the protocol that we've, we've developed and are following internally. Fairly easy, but also a lot of places to mess it up. I think. Well, <laughs> was, just like is everything. The same for a lot of, yeah, just like everything. Exactly. Um, you, you mentioned at the beginning that kind of each facility or, or location got a slightly different protocol. So like what were some of the maybe differences that you would have implemented or, or considerations that would have been put into place? Yeah. So definitely the guilt management is has to be very specific to your farm. So on one farm, we had our offset or our, our quarantine barns on site so we could load those up. Another one of our sites, we didn't have a quarantine barn. And so we just loaded as many gilts as we could and just, just closed the herd and said the opportunity cost for this one is, is a little bit higher. Um, being an integrated or an integrator, we see the benefit in those downstream pigs. Um, if you're only a sow farm operator or if you're a sow an, ex an isoene exporter, it might be a little bit harder to justify some of those costs because uh, all the costs end up falling on the sow farm and, and realistically the benefits are in the finisher. Um, so that was, those were the main differences that we would see going from farm to farm. And then just the presentation of the data. Some people like to see the big picture. They like to see, you know, what do I need to do six months from now? Other people say, I don't really care. Just tell me what I have to do tomorrow and I'll get it done. And then come back two days from now and tell me what I have to do the next day. So you really have to know your people in order to make it successful. Yeah. Um, so that's a good segue talking about the people, because, you know, we say a lot of the times the pigs are easy. <laughs> it's the people that are more difficult. So like when when you're doing this, maybe what are some of the challenges other than what, what you've kind of just mentioned, you know, that kind of came up? Yeah. So, um, so like I said, the, the people for sure. And we actually had, um, I think it's a good story, a good story because we have to learn from them all. But we had the first one that we did, everything went almost too well until we got to the finishers and we had one barn that just could not keep pigs negative, absolutely could not. And, you know, going through and doing biosecurity audits and visiting and just spending the days with them to see what could possibly go wrong. And, and they're good people, but they really need to understand how easy it is to move these things. And so what we ended up switching around was, was the people we put, you know, the aces in the places. We said, if, if you're, if someone's not great at going from A to B and then not going back to A, then let's only have them work at A or let's only have them work at B. And by changing those things, that's actually how we ended up getting mycoplasma out of that last finishing barn was addressing the people. I think another big thing with people is having the finishing staff when biosecurity allows, have them go to your cell barn and help with the cleanup and help with those mass vaccinations and help with some of those things because it's very labor intensive and it just shows the cell barn staff that, hey, they really care about this too because they really want to see the improved health in these pigs and we're, we're just one team here. Um, some of the other challenges that we faced were... <laughs> Um, sometimes even just obtaining the medication, we have our own feed mill. So if you don't have your own feed mill, it might be a little more difficult to have rotating and rotation of those medications. You're only medicating certain, certain, um, rations at certain times and calling of sows can be an issue as well. So when you're running all these medications, person, we, 
we in particular will do our lincomycin first because it has a shorter withdrawal. And then if they need to with, need to call anything, you can get them out of there and then start your chlor chlortetracycline or you end up with some pretty old ladies on farm that are that are not very productive. Um, breeding targets can be hard to hit as well because everyone on the farm is just getting older. You're not getting any new gilts in. Your curve gets a little bit, a little bit off, a little bit weird, right? Um, and so preparing people that your production will suffer in the short term because of this, and that's that's okay. That's expected. We will minimize it as much as we can, but be prepared to struggle a little bit. It's it's always that messaging, like because they're so used to meeting those targets and wanting to like maximize all that, right? And <laughs> we we see that all the time here. But we run a new, uh, like a study or anything, right? Where it's like, but but we want to get this. We're like, yeah, but don't worry about it right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You'll be way higher than that later, maybe. <laughs> so like, I guess the the next question, maybe this is a little bit obvious. Um, but once you've eradicated again, then what would be the potential uh, other than maybe just typical biosecurity measures of making sure that it doesn't come back in and you, or you don't break again? Yeah, so that's really, really a good question, actually, because you've spent all this time and, and a lot of money um, dealing with this disease, getting rid of it. Now you call yourself ne negative or and, and so how do you prevent it from getting back in? It's, it's absolutely, you, you said it, right? It's increasing biosecurity. It's increasing awareness as well. I feel um, efficiency and biosecurity are just polar opposites. It, it feels the more efficient you are, the more your biosecurity will suffer, right? So by having everybody on your team, your manager, your production manager, your swine technicians, your assistant managers, everybody needs to be in the know and everybody needs to be their own barn's gatekeeper, right? If someone comes on farm, you say, hey, I, you know, I'm not really sure why, why you're here or can you let me know where you were last? And because we're an integrated system, we know other barns, we know what the health status is, we know where people have come from. And so I'm not going to say it's easy to track, but but we know what is okay and what is a high risk or a low risk versus high risk activity. I guess there's no there's no this is safe and that's not safe. It's just the the level of risk that you're willing to take. For us, transport was a difficult one. Um, sharing vehicle or sharing sharing um, trailers. That's the word. Sharing trailers. Um, you don't want to do that. But by dedicating a trailer to one particular flow is again less less efficient, um, ongoing herd health or herd sampling. So we will do tracheal swabs. And then because we eradicated PERS at the same time, we take blood samples as well, just to, just to, to double check, Hey, everything's still, still going okay out here, because if you don't look for it, you're not going to find it. So we really follow that. If you, if you want to know that you're truly negative for something, you have to aggressively look for it because there's no sense in digging your head into the sand. So I, I know you mentioned at the beginning, you know, you, these, I don't know, is it two or three uh, facilities that you kind of picked to look at this because of the flows made it a little bit easier or whatever. Is this something that you think that, you know, the majority of facilities or producers would be able to implement if they wanted to, or is there going to be some situations that might be, you know, more difficult or, or almost impossible? Yeah. So I mean, I have a dream that just everybody will eradicate and we just won't have to deal with this anymore. Um, but realistically, I think that you would have to get everybody in one geographical area on the same page. There are a few different studies out that look at, you know, is it aerosol transmitted or how are we getting it from one barn to another? It is predominantly vertically transmitted, but there is evidence of some horizontal transmission as well. So when you're in a very hog dense area and all of your neighbors are positive, it's really hard to justify going through this process. I think you you can, and you probably will get rid of it, but your odds of rebreaking are are pretty high, right? So so you have to look at that and see is it is it going to be worth it? Am I going to have my ROI or if I'm going to break again in 6 months, maybe maybe I just focus more on minimizing the amount of pathogen that I have on my farm so that my pigs can be healthier downstream. Maybe maybe getting a little bit philosophical to kind of as we're getting to the end here, you know, is there are there lessons that you have learned from this 
eradicating a, a, of mycoplasma that you could see applying to maybe other pathogens or, or situations? Yeah. So we've we've done a few different eradications, and predominantly they're viral. Um, mycoplasma being a bacteria is a little bit different. I was hoping to apply these principles to some things like ASUS. Um, not not so successful. I don't I don't know why at this point, but um, I think some of the the load close expose and then the the really minimizing the pathogen is something that we've learned that we can apply for other things. Um, seeing what's circulating before you open your herd and really assessing: Am I am I stable? Am I not stable? And just because I find it doesn't mean that what I found is still alive. So being able to differentiate a live versus a an infect or infectious versus non infectious lab result, right? And if you're going to be taking these labs, make sure you know what to do with that result. Don't take it to look because you're going to get that positive back and say, I don't know how to, I don't know what to do with this, and I don't know how to tell my farm. Make sure you have those contingency plans. That was something that really came up as well. There's lots of things to to eradicate and. I think, but I think we'll, we will get there, but it's a big, it's going to be a big, big, big thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ho- hopefully we can get, uh, eradicate more and, <laughs> or have more farms that, that, that get rid of this. So before we get to the take home, is there any topic that we have not touched on that you would like to? I guess the only thing that I wanted to maybe briefly mention was just some of the exposure techniques that we can use because establishing your day zero is so critical, then your exposure needs to be successful, right? So when we did our projects, we used a lung homogenate from gilts that we had had sacrificed on farm um, that had recently entered. I don't believe we need to sacrifice gilts anymore. They are perfectly healthy animals and a lot of the time they are also pregnant because they've been bred. They've been on farm for probably four to eight weeks now. And it's just, it's very difficult for, you know, for me and probably even more so difficult for the farm staff to to help with those, with euthanizing her to make the lung homogenate to expose the animals. I like the lung homogenate because it's something we've obtained on farm. So I know it's the right mycoplasma, but I think that moving forward as an industry there we can we can do better. We can do things like BAL or we can like a bronco like a lavage. So we just just grab the bacteria from the trachea, or we can do tracheal swabs, mix it with some media, and then put that in our fogger and and uh, and infect gilts that way. I think it's it's better for the animals. It works, and it's it's where we need to be heading. Obviously, if you're already dealing with this, you don't want to be dealing with having to kill animals in order to fix this. Exactly, too, right? so, yeah. exactly. It was a good place to start, and now we, now we can we can improve. Always improving, which is, which is good. So, okay, uh, we are kind of getting to the end of the time. So, I will ask you know if there's one or two kind of take home messages or, or or things that you want our listeners to kind of go away with. Like, what would those be? Yeah, I think when you're planning a mycoplasma eradication or any eradication in general, it's really important to make sure that your goal as a veterinarian, our goal is just, oh, let's get let's get rid of all the diseases, let's get rid of the bugs. But let's make sure that we have aligned ourselves with our producers and make sure that they have the same goal. Take a good look. It's fun to get rid of diseases, right? It's it's one more box that we can check, but it might not be in the best interest of the farm. Maybe the best interest is stabilization because of where they're located or because of the type of producer that they are or, you know, for this or that. So make sure that your goals are aligned so that you're on the same page and and you, you have the same, the compliance will be there because you want the same things. Um, the other takeaway that I would have is talk to other vets that have done this if this is your first one. Just because we've we've all made mistakes and we've all learned from those mistakes, and there's no sense in in other people making the same ones. <laughs> yeah, no, so that I it's great. Obvious communication, right? Talk exactly. to the people, figure it out. What what do people want, and what what should you be doing in that situation? I think that's great. It's time for our famous three. Okay, before I let you go, we ask all our guests. Three questions. I <laughs> <laughs> heard these questions. Oh, man. Okay. Okay. So, well, then you should be a little bit prepared for it then. I'm not. That's the worst part. <laughs> okay. So, 
Anyway, our, our first question is, what is your favorite go-to swine or agriculture-related resource? Right. So I want to tell you that it's a book because I love books, but it's not. And um, I actually just find, well, I guess it is, but I use the Swine Disease Manual, the online version, because I find it's more up-to-date. And I actually just got rid of all of my paper copies because they're out of date and they're just not. I worry that I'm going to learn something wrong, right? Review something wrong. So so the Swine Disease Manual, it, it, that's the one that I use. Could have seen that one coming. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, so our second question then may be the opportunity to mention a book <laughs> because this is, uh, you know, something that isn't related to swine or agriculture that, you know, you've read recently or a particular favorite from the past, you know? Yeah. So my, one of my favorite books that I read recently is actually called Shards of Earth by Adrian Tchaikovsky. It's like kind of a sci-fi book. I really like that genre because it, it kind of, takes me away from from real life, I guess. I, I love my life. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's all about people that are in space and they have different, they ha- it, it's, it's people and they're in space and then there's different aliens and different species that all live together and they're trying to save the galaxy kind of. I don't know, it's pretty nerdy, but, but I really like it. <laughs> You know what? Sometimes you need something to get away because you can't read the swine health manual all the time. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And I don't want anything too heavy, right? You just want to be able to listen and enjoy or read and enjoy. I, I'm the same philosophy. If I'm going to read at home, it's not science. It has to be something else. Yeah. It can be science fiction uh, though. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. And then our last question is, you know, when you think back to uh, successful swine professionals or leaders, you know, what is a characteristic that they all seem to have in common that, that makes them successful? I think that the characteristic that makes that there's two individuals I'm thinking of right now and what they both have in common um, is the ability to teach people. Um, so they're both, they're, you know, they're, they're very, very smart, but they're very good at hope. And now we're circling back to communication. So it's, it's their ability to change information and put it into a way that the person they're teaching will understand and then giving them the opportunity to use that information and, and grow themselves. That, that, that one comes up quite often, right? You, you can be the smartest person in the world, but if you can't give that knowledge and, and effectively to somebody else, then it's not, it's limited. No, I, I think that's great. So, well, okay. You made it through the three questions. You made it through <laughs> your presentation, right? Uh, uh, I, I, I think it's been a, a great episode with lots of good information. So uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, coming on and, and discussing this and, so definitely thank you. Thank you for, for participating and thanks to our audience for listening. Great. Thank you.